15 April 1943, Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler declared, Victory at Kursk will be a beacon for the whole world. A month later, on 13 May, the 250,000 troops of Africa Corps remaining in Tunisia surrendered to the Allies. Hitler then confided to General Heinz Guderian about the plans for Kursk, quote, When I think of this attack, my stomach turns over, end quote. How did this screaming, self-proclaimed leader of the master race become this ambivalent? Welcome to Season 3 of Beyond Barbarossa, the first English-language podcast in the world to focus on the Eastern Front of World War II. I'm Scott Burry, and I'm recording this episode, as I always do, in the Redbeard studio on traditional Anishinaabe Algonquin land, also known as Ottawa, Canada. And yes, this is Season 3 episode 51. I'm pretty excited. I have to admit, proud for reaching this milestone. Now, before I get into this episode's details, I just want to thank all of you for listening and for following and many of you for supporting the show. If you have a chance, please leave a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Amazon, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. That really helps. Also, just a reminder that Patreon supporters get an ad-free version of the show. And you can become a Patreon patron by supporting at any level, whether it's monthly or just once. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa. Now, let's get into this third season and 51st episode. I'm sorry, I still can't get over the fact that I've done 50 episodes and this is number 51. Anyway, on to it. As you longtime listeners know, this podcast has been roughly tracking the chronological development of the war in Eastern Europe. So, the podcast started on 22nd June 2022, which was 81 years to the day after the launch of Operation Barbarossa, Germany's invasion of its erstwhile ally, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and the greatest land invasion in history. As I record this, it's June 2024, which takes us through that little tracking idea I have, virtually back to June 1943, the midpoint of the war. I don't think it's a spoiler for anyone to say that the Second World War in Europe ended in May 1945. So now the situation at this midpoint is markedly different from the beginning and even from a year earlier in June 1942. By June 1943, the cracks in the Axis strength are obvious and getting wider. If we just go back a little bit. The winter of 1942 to 1943, the USSR's enormous Operation Uranus not only defeated the Germans at Stalingrad on the Volga River, 
It encircled whole armies. The Red Army destroyed the German 6th Army and captured its commander, Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus. He would be the only German Field Marshal ever to surrender, much to the disappointment of the Nazi's leader, Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. He expected any field marshal, especially one that he appointed, to commit suicide before surrendering. It was a tradition. Soon after that victory, the Soviets launched more offensive operations to drive the Nazis back from their territory. They pushed the Germans back from Leningrad far enough to enable them to bring in more supplies. The city was still under siege, but at least it was not as dire as it had been in the winter of 1941 to 1942, when a million people starved or froze to death. The Red Army also drove the Germans back from the Volga and across the Don River again. They liberated the city of rostov on don in February and briefly liberated Kharkiv in Ukraine until Germany's best general, Erich von Manstein, took it back. The Germans also withdrew from two deep salients north and west of Moscow, Demyansk and Rzhev. This was logical. It allowed the Germans to shorten their lines, and that made them easier to defend against Soviet counterattack. It also freed up dozens of divisions that had been in those salients or pockets and allowed them to be deployed for fighting elsewhere on the Eastern Front. But the thing is, that these moves demonstrated a huge shift in German strategy and thinking. Up to this point, Hitler had forbidden any retreat or withdrawal by German forces. That stubborn mindset resulted in the destruction of the 6th Army at Stalingrad. Now, as I mentioned, Hitler had taken personal, direct command of the war in the East. Essentially, he was micromanaging it. And now he was allowing the Wehrmacht commanders to make decisions about withdrawing when it made sense. Clearly, as the British would say, Germany is on the back foot in Eastern Europe. The Red Army has the initiative. That's not to say that the Red Army is just rolling westward, retaking their land. The Wehrmacht remains a deadly opponent and Red Army attack after attack fails. Soviet losses still outnumber German casualties by at least two to one, if not an order of magnitude or more. Still, by 1943, many who pay attention to the war, including in Germany, realize Germany cannot win in the East. That's the situation on the Eastern Front. And before we go any further, it's time for our regular feature. What else is happening in the war? By May 1943, American and British Commonwealth forces have cornered the Axis from across North America, forcing them into a shrinking area in Tunisia. On 13 May, the remaining Africa Corps surrender, and the Allies take 250,000 prisoners. In the Battle of the Atlantic, the Germans lose the initiative there due to improved anti-submarine tactics. In May, the Germans lose 43 U-boats while sinking 34 Allied ships. Admiral Karl Donitz orders the remaining U-boats back to port. In Europe... British dambuster planes bomb three German dams, knocking out electrical power in the heavily industrialized Ruhr Valley. This was essential to German war material production. As I described in episode 46 in March, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was a hopeless rebellion by Jewish people who were forced into a tiny part of the Polish capital, came to a brutal end as the SS Brigade Fuhrer Jürgen's troop leveled the ghetto on 16 May. In June, the Japanese withdraw their last forces from the Aleutian Islands in the northern Pacific. Later that same month, the Americans begin Operation Cartwheel with the new Georgia campaign. These are landings in the Solomon Islands in the western Pacific to neutralize a major Japanese base at Rabaul in New Guinea. 
Also in June, the coming Allied invasion of Sicily becomes clear to anyone who's paying attention, including the Italians and the Germans. On the 11th of June, the British take Pantelleria, an Italian island between Sicily and Tunisia, and capture 11,000 Italian troops in the process. The next day, the island of Lampedusa, south of Pantelleria, surrenders to the Allies. And then, on the 17th, less than a week later, the Allies bomb Sicily and southern Italy. So now we shift to the Eastern Front. Overall, the front lines on the Eastern Front in June 1943 kind of look very similar to the position a year earlier, before the beginning of Operation Blue, Germans, the German drive to the Caucasus and Stalingrad. But behind the scenes, so to speak, the situation is very different. Hitler, as I mentioned, has been directing the action of the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht. When Operation Typhoon, the German attempt to take Moscow, failed in December 1941, Hitler fired Army Commander-in-Chief Walter von Brauchitscht and appointed himself in the post. Hitler had previously ordered the splitting of the panzers north and south after the Battle of Smolensk in August 1941. This move is still debated by historians today. Some say it ultimately doomed the German attempt to conquer the USSR. Others say it was the only logical choice. Anyway, Hitler overrode several of his generals in that decision. And then, in 1942, he dictated again against the advice of certain uh, German professional soldiers. He ordered Operation Blue to proceed. That was the attempt to conquer the oil fields of the North Caucasus, and which embroiled the 6th Army in Stalingrad and ultimately led to its destruction. Chaos in the senior ranks of the general staff continued. In late 1942, just before that final loss in Stalingrad, Hitler fired the chief of the general staff, Franz Halder, and replaced him with General Kurt Zeitzler. The Soviet situation was also very different from what it had been in 1941. In contrast to Hitler, Stalin seemed to gradually begin to trust his generals more. From the beginning of the conflict in June 1941, Stalin had micromanaged every aspect of the Soviet war effort, down to the tactical level. He repeatedly ordered not one step back. Any soldier or officer who retreated without authorization from senior command would be shot. And Stalin ordered many generals to be shot, including General Dmitry Pavlov, commander of the Western Front in July 1941. Stalin also shuffled senior generals like playing cards, moving them after failures or rare successes. For example, on 22nd June 1941, the Commander-in-Chief of Armed Forces and the People's Commissar for Defense, essentially the Defense Minister, was Semyon Timoshenko, the general who had taken over the Red Army's operations in Finland during the Winter War in 1940. Stalin replaced Timoshenko in that role with himself, upon Germany's attack. He also sent Georgi Zhukov, who had been, up to that point, chief of the general staff, to command the reserve front, in effect becoming a field general. To some people, this seemed like a demotion. To others, such as historian David Stahl, this was a shrewd move to put a very capable field general in charge of an essential part of the defense. Stalin would later send Zhukov to command the defense of Leningrad and also Timoshenko in the summer of 1941 to command the Central Front to defend Smolensk. He would then send Timoshenko to Ukraine to defend Kiev. Other generals like Rokossovsky, Budeny, Vatutin, and others were also moved around repeatedly. By 1943, Stalin was giving more room for senior generals like Alexander Vasilevsky, Alexei Antonov, and, of course, Zhukov, to make their own decisions. We'll see how that plays out in the run-up to 1943's big summer conflict. <laughs> 
Before we get to that though, there's something else in the background that we need to look at. It's not something that a lot of popular histories of the Second World War pay a lot of attention to. The production and supply of war materiel and other essentials. Let's start with Lendlease. In 1943, the Allies delivered 4,794,545 tons of all kinds of supplies to the USSR. That was more than a quarter of all lend lease shipments to the Soviet Union through the war. And the great bulk of it came from the United States. If you want to hear more details about the lend lease program, I've done a full episode on it. Just take a look in the index for all the episodes at beyondbarbarossa.ca. Both Zhukov and Stalin would say after the war that the USSR could not have prevailed without this aid. But that's just one part of the story. At the outbreak of German-Soviet hostilities in June 1941, the Soviets began moving more than 1,500 factories east beyond the reach of German bombers. This took them offline for months until they could be reassembled in the Urals or somewhere else. But by 1943, these factories were up and running at greater levels than they had been before the war. Another thing to look at, too, is the losses. From June to September 1941, the first three months of Operation Barbarossa, the Soviet Union lost nearly 15,000 tanks, 66,000 artillery pieces and mortars, and 7,000 aircraft. But between 1942 and 1944, Soviet production of materiel ramped up, as did Germany's. But consistently, the Soviets far outstripped them. I put a table on the webpage for this episode, thanks to Evan Maudsley's book, Thunder in the East, for this information. Now, I'm going to give you just a few highlights because I know numbers are hard to follow in verbal descriptions like this. So, hold on. Strap yourself to your chair. Between 1942 and 1944, Soviet production of machine guns went from 356,000 per year to 439,000 per year. Tank output increased from 24,000 in 1942 to 29,000 at the end of the war. Warplane output went from 22,000 up by 50% to 33,000 by the end of the war. German production lied consistently. They began the war in the East with fewer tanks, airplanes, and artillery than the enemy had. And every year they produced far fewer. So at the beginning of Barbarossa in 1941, the German factories were producing 6,000 tanks per year. That's a quarter of the Soviet output, as you can see in the table. And the Germans were building just over half the number of warplanes that the USSR produced. And this is happening while they're fighting a two-front war. They're fighting in the air over Britain as well as over Eastern Europe. And then, as of December 1941, the Americans are in the action. Now, German output did grow through the war but it never approached the numbers of the USSR's production, let alone that of the Americans. A caveat here, the Soviet losses of equipment far outstripped the Germans. Remember how the Germans destroyed thousands of Soviet planes on the ground at the opening of Operation Barbarossa? The Soviets would continue to lose multiple times the number of tanks, self-propelled guns, airplanes, and other artillery compared to the Germans not to mention the numbers of people. Again, I'm drawing from Evan Maudsley's numbers. The Soviet Union lost 28,200 tanks and self-propelled guns in 1941, 47,900 in 1943, and nearly 60,000 in 1944. In comparison, 
total German tank losses through the war on all fronts from 1939 to 1945, so over six years, was 67,000. Whereas, just as a reminder, in one year alone, 1944, the Soviets lost 60,000 tanks. 60,000 one year versus 67,000 over six years on two fronts. Okay, that's enough numbers for one podcast. Let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll get into the biggest battle in military history, starting with the German plan that led up to it. Hi, Scott here. I hope you're enjoying this episode and that you get a lot out of the whole podcast. Beyond Barbarossa is still, as far as I can tell, the only English language podcast in the world that focuses on the Eastern Front of World War II. If you do like it and you want to help me keep it going, please give it a rating or a review on Apple, Google, Amazon, Podbean, or whatever podcasting platform you listen to it on. That helps let other people know about it. Patreon is another way you can support the podcast, my research, and podcasting expenses. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa and sign up at whatever level of support you choose. Patreon supporters get early, ad-free access to new episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes on topics like the Winter War between the USSR and Finland and the pre-Barbarossa invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939. Check it out, won't you? Just go to patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa. Thanks. Did you know that the cappuccino was invented by a Ukrainian? Or that many first names, like Philip and Agatha, were brought to Western Europe by Ukrainian princesses? Or that a Ukrainian was the first female given the rank of officer in a modern army? Well, if you didn't, and even if you did, you can learn more about my podcast, Wandering the Edge, a podcast about Ukrainian history with a spot of travel, and all in English. And if you like Beyond Barbarossa as much as I do, because, well, it makes my life a whole lot easier since I don't have to do any episodes deep diving into the Eastern Front of the Second World War, please take a listen to Wandering the Edge for a deep dive into Ukrainian history, culture, and traditions. Find out more on wanderingtheedge.net. And now let's get back to Scott exploring and explaining the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Thanks for coming back. Now, let's turn our attention to Germany's plan for an offensive on the Eastern Front in the summer of 1943, Operation Zitadel, or Citadel. The loss of the 6th Army at Stalingrad and Germany's subsequent withdrawal from the Caucasus, Demyansk and Rzhev, left Hitler with a desire, a need, to re-establish Germany's image as a military juggernaut. According to several historians, in the first half of 1943, Hitler was worried that Mussolini might withdraw Italy from the war and sue for a separate peace. Hitler needed a major victory to be, quote, a beacon seen around the world, end quote. So, in March 1943, General Zeitzler, the new chief of staff of the German Army High Command, proposed an offensive that would start immediately after the spring Rasputitsa, the season of no roads, when the spring melt and rain turns all the roads, which were not hard-topped, into deep piles of mud, making movement almost impossible. At this point, the Soviet advances and the German counterattacks of the winter before had created a huge westward bulge in the front lines, a bulge toward Germany, centered roughly on the city of Kursk in Russia. This bulge was 185 kilometers or 115 miles north to south and 135 kilometers or 80 miles east to west. 
You can see it clearly on the map on the web page for this episode. Zeisler's plan was to concentrate as many units as the Germans could scrape together in the southern sector of the Eastern Front and then attack from the northern and southern corners of the bulge, cutting off and encircling huge numbers of Soviet armies, just as they had done two years earlier. If the Germans struck early before the Red Army could dig in, they could weaken any further plans the Soviets might have had for a summer offensive. Initially, Hitler liked the idea. But many of the professional generals in the German high command were less enthusiastic. An operation at this scale, over 100 miles long, would require a huge number of resources. And German losses, as I mentioned earlier, meant they just didn't have the numbers. Where the Germans had deployed over 3 million men for the three sectors of Operation Barbarossa, and nearly 872,000 in Army Group South, and then a year later for Operation Blue bringing over a million men. By 1943, they could muster only 782,000 in the southern sector. That's still a huge army, or, or rather group of armies. But this 782,000? would face nearly 2 million enemies. In addition, the professional soldiers of the Wehrmacht High Command were worried about what would happen in the Mediterranean and in Western Europe now that the Allies had driven them out of North Africa and were threatening Sicily. The planning for this attack on the Eastern Front went ahead, but it kept getting delayed. The original plan, based on Zeisler's proposal, was presented by Field Marshal Erich von Manstein. He had been put in overall command of Army Group South, and his idea was the two-pronged attack to begin on those north and southern corners of the bulge as soon as the mud season, the Berezina or Rasputitsa, was over. On 13 March, Hitler agreed and issued Operational Order No. 5. This authorized attacks all along the Eastern Front, including at the Kursk salient. But... Before the Rasputitsa was over, these orders were postponed. Then, on 15 April 1943, Operational Order No. 6 named the Kursk Offensive Zitadel, or Citadel, and slated it to start in early May. Then, on 4th May, Hitler delayed Zitadel again to mid-June. On 21st June, the eve of the anniversary of Operation Barbarossa, Hitler postponed the attack on Kursk to the beginning of July. Why? Well, there continued to be disagreement about the planning of the operation, specifically the timing, and that's why the date kept getting changed. Von Manstein had wanted to attack as soon as possible, ideally catching the Red Army off guard as soon as the ground was hard enough. But others, like General Walter Model and Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, wanted more time to assemble greater forces on the front. Both Model and Chief of Staff Zeitzer felt they needed to bring up reserves and new equipment, including the Tiger heavy tanks and the new Panther medium tank. The Germans ultimately delayed long enough to bring up those 780,000 men, along with 2,110 aircraft, 2,928 tanks, which itself included 211 Tigers and 484 Panthers, and nearly 10,000 heavy guns and mortars. Another new development deployed at Kursk was the Ferdinand self-propelled heavy assault gun, also called the Elephant. It was basically a turretless Tiger, the armored chassis of the Tiger with the 88mm gun mounted on top. Aiming the elephant required turning the whole machine, but it did prove to be a deadly tank destroyer. 
these months, the Soviet high command was also in a quandary. The Germans had paused, especially in the southern sector. Author Evan Wadsley put it this way, quote, From April to June 1943, both the Germans and the Russians suffered their lowest losses for any quarterly period of the war. The best figure for German losses in the East gives 48,000 for this quarter, half that of any other. Meanwhile, the best Russian figure, not directly comparable with the German one, was 125,000. It's triple. Gee whiz. While great in an absolute sense, these losses were for the Russians a third that of any quarter year of the war so far. End quote. Still, the quiet seemed to unnerve Stalin. Should the Red Army take this operational pause by the Germans as an opportunity to strike? On one hand, to quote Mosley again, quote, the Red Army would gain an advantage by letting the Wehrmacht impale itself on the Russian defenses at Kursk, end quote. On the other hand, it did give the enemy more time to build up their offensive forces, as well as dig in defenses if they were not planning to attack. Stalin also wondered whether the Red Army, even though it's now stronger, larger, and well supplied by Western allies, could withstand another blitzkrieg as they had experienced in 1941 and 1942. Would the third be the undoing of the Soviet Union? One thing they did know, the Germans' plans. To start with, the shape of the front, that deep salient, made it obvious what the initial target would be, although General Georgi Zhukov still thought the ultimate goal would be Moscow. I turn to historian Antony Bivor to say it best. Seldom has a major offensive been as obvious to the enemy as the Germans' Operation Citadel to cut off the Soviet salient around Kursk. Stalin's commanders estimated that the Germans could afford only one major attack, and the Kursk bulge was clearly the most vulnerable sector of their line. End quote. What's more, Soviet air reconnaissance could see the German buildup in the area. This was confirmed by partisans behind the German lines and other spies. The British passed on some information they gleaned from their ultra decoders, which had broken the German Enigma code. Also, there were Soviet spies in British intelligence who were passing information on to the Stavka about the buildup at Kursk. Knowing all this, General Zhukov, Vasilevsky, and Antonov convinced Stalin to wait to let the Germans as Bivor put it, impale themselves on Russian defenses. Zhukov said, quote, It would be better if we were to wear down the enemy on our defenses, destroy his tanks, and then, throwing in fresh reserves, we can go over to a general offensive and decisively defeat the basic concentration of the enemy. End quote. The Soviets prepared great defenses around the Kursk salient. They mobilized 300,000 civilians to build eight successive lines of defenses, which included deep tank ditches, reinforced underground bunkers, barbed wire, and more than 9,000 kilometers of trenches. According to Bivor, quote, in places the defenses went back nearly 300 kilometers, end quote. During that relative lull between May and July, Red Army patrols went out at night to capture Germans and interrogate them. In this way, they gained invaluable information about the exact deployment of German units, their type, size, and strength. The Stavka, Soviet High Command, also drew up plans for a major offensive operation to launch after the German attack was defeated. General Vatutin's Voronezhfront, or Group of Armies, would strike out to the south of the Kursk bulge toward Belgorod and Kharkiv, penetrate deep into German-held territory, and cut off Army Group Center from Army Group South. The Deployments By early July, 1943. The Germans had brought up those 780,000 men, 3,000 tanks, including 200 Panthers, 200 
1911 Tigers and 90 Ferdinand or Elephant Heavy Tank Destroyers to the Kursk salient. This would be the last really big concentration of German forces. As I said, they concentrated their offensive forces in two places, at the northern and southern corners of the salient, where the lines curved from north-south to east-west, and then back again. In the northern corner were the ninth in the northern corner were the Ninth Army, part of Army Group Center, under General Modo, including the 47th and 51st Panzer Corps, which had six Panzer divisions. Its objective was to drive south to the east of Kursk and secure a rail line to prevent the Red Army from bringing in reinforcements. The group on the southern corner was stronger. This was von Manstein's Army Group South, including Hermann Hoth's 4th Panzer Army, which had established a fearsome reputation in the Caucasus region in the summer before. This group included the 48th Panzer Corps of three Panzer divisions, plus the 2nd SS Panzer Corps with three Panzer Grenadier or Army divisions. There is also Army Group Kempf, commanded by General Werner Kempf. This group or detachment had the 3rd Panzer Corps with three more Panzer divisions. They would actually have two prongs of attack. Hot's 4th Panzer Army would advance straight north to meet Modal's 9th Army, east of Kursk. Paul Hauser's 2nd SS Panzer Corps, which had retaken Kharkiv the previous march, would be the tip of the spear. Meanwhile, the 48th Panzer Corps would advance on the left of Hot, and Army Detachment Kempf would strike to the right. Guarding the western edge of the salient, the part that sort of straight up north and south, was the 2nd Army, commanded by Walter Weiss. Yes. Walter White in German. Sounds like a good plan, right? After all, this involves 15 panzer and armored divisions. Two years earlier, at the outset of Operation Barbarossa, Army Group Center had only nine panzer divisions, each of which was smaller with less advanced tanks and spread over a much larger area. But as I said, the Soviets had taken that three-month pause to get ready for this operation. And they knew how big it would be. So they concentrated 11 Red Armies in the salient. Now, Red Armies were smaller than German armies. Divisions varied in size, but each Red Army division was usually about half a number of men compared to the Germans. Still, this concentration outnumbered the German offenders, the German attackers. In the northern sector was Konstantin Rokossovsky's Central Army Group with four infantry armies plus the second tank army. In the south, Nikolai Vatutin's Voronezh Army Group comprised five infantry armies plus the first tank army in reserve. And then the Stavka moved up the Steppe Army Group as a reserve. Stationed to the east of the Kursk salient, it included two guards armies. A guards army was had earned that designation as a result of achievements in the field. So they were supposedly an elite or somewhat better army. Anyway, so that uh, army group included those uh, two guards armies, three regular infantry armies, and the fifth guards tank army. In total, this was 22, 22 infantry armies plus five tank armies. Just for some perspective, Operation Uranus, the operation that liberated Stalingrad, had 14 infantry armies, one tank army, and a number of other attached mechanized corps. So, in sum, the Germans had assembled 780,000 men to attack 1,910,361 Red Army personnel, of which... 1.5 million were combat soldiers. The Germans had 2,928 tanks against 5,128 Soviet tanks, 9,966 German artillery pieces against 25,013 on the Red Army side, 2,110 German aircraft against anywhere from 2,792 to 3,549 Soviet planes. 
I'm sorry, I, I did promise not to have too many more numbers, but you get the idea. Conventional military doctrine prescribes at least a two to one advantage in numbers for attackers to be successful, but generally they prefer three to one. Now, the Germans had never had that advantage on the Eastern Front. They instead depended on better training, leadership strategy, tactics, and weaponry to get as far as they had. But at Kursk, though they may not have known this fully, that two-to-one advantage was on the Red Army side. No wonder Hitler's stomach turned over. So how would this play out? Well, this episode has gone on quite a long time already. Let's see the development of the Battle of Kursk next episode in two weeks. Put it in your calendar, 8th July. Oh, okay, that's more than two weeks, but I want to go back to the regular releases on every second Monday. This episode, the opening of Season 3, happened on 22nd June for the anniversary of the beginning of the war on the Eastern Front. So... Moving back to Mondays, that brings us to 8th July. If you can't wait that long, Patreon donors and subscribers get early ad-free access to episodes plus occasional bonus episodes. So once again, go to patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa.ca. Thank you for listening to Beyond Barbarossa, the podcast about the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Curious about what the Kursk salient looked like? There are maps on the webpage for this episode. Just go to beyondbarbarossa.ca or beyondbarbarossa.podbean.com and click on the title for this episode. You can also listen to the episode on my own website, writtenword.ca, and just click on the podcast button in the banner. If you like this episode, please consider following Beyond Barbarossa on your preferred podcasting app. And I'd really appreciate a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you listen. That helps others who may be interested in the Eastern Front to find the show. And if you have a few minutes, please consider leaving a review. I want to again thank all who have supported the podcast through Patreon. Here's a special shout out to the latest Patreon supporters, Tom Gaffney. Craig Duncan, Elliot Goldman, Gavin Edwards, William L. Hall, and Nicholas A. Thomas. Thank you very much for your support. And as this is episode 51 and the opening of season three, I'm just going to give a shout out to the regular followers. Gibsonian46, Gilles Doucet, Damien Beeman, J.D. Sheppa, Mason Duke, Magnus, Jim Peck, Old Pete, Julie Aylbrecht, James Christian, Benjamin, Jobby, Javier Brun, Reguimares, I'm sorry if I butchered that, David May, Tauntaun, Calla Wilkes, again, my apologies, MMC, Arnold, Lima, Ohio Man, Rob Dog, Brent Reed, and Daniel Heron. Thank you very much for all your support and for following me. Again, if you have a chance, to contact at beyondbarbarossa.ca. A question, a comment, a suggestion, goodness for a friend, a correction, whatever you want to say. Every patron does so. at random to receive a signed paperback copy of the Eastern Front Trilogy, which includes those three books. Original music was composed and recorded by Nicholas Burry. I'm Scott Burry. Until next episode, keep your paddles in the water. Slava Ukraine.